right, folks. Let's get started. Nobody did the extra credit. I'm really disappointed at all of you. Can you give us a How do you how do you do it? Ask more. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. It's still uh, we're still within the time frame. Are we? Because if one of you gets it, you get 80% extra credit. Oh. So when will when will be allowed to tell us? Yeah, let's get it. Let's say next Tuesday. How about that? Next Tuesday. Maybe Thursday. <laughs> how about how about a hint since it's late? Oh, oh hints. Yeah, End of this semester. I mean, technically that was a hint. Yeah. Yeah. That's more. Are you giving any extension? No. That's not No. No, I said well, next Tuesday I'll, we'll talk about the hint. Oh, what it was. <laughs> okay, other things real quickly. So some of you... There's still, uh, I know many people have talked to me about the scholarship for service stuff. The deadline was technically last week. If you get your application in quickly, we can review it quickly. So do it, yes. Quickly as in like the next week? Or? Yeah, like do it, like as soon as possible. Are you part of the Yes. Uh, admitting it, I would say, from the ASU side. So. Yeah, so you know we we want you guys are most of you are primed right at the right level because um, if we can get you in now we can get like starting because the, the key is to be able to go to the career fair in DC in January so if we can't get you processed by then you can't go to the career fair and you can't get an internship for the summer so it's all about like securing that that pipeline so there's definitely still time please do it as soon as possible. All right. Any questions on that? He said not looking at hands. So I was yeah. going to say, like, the L of the letter of recommendation from the faculty. Is that uh, like an important thing that we need to have included, or can we kind of like? I would submit your application as soon as possible, and you can get in any supplemental material that you need that's still coming in as it comes in. Right. So just get in your application, and then you can get those things in. Yeah. Is only one person to be chosen? No, many. We have $4 million to give away so over the lifetime of this grant. So, uh, yeah. Actually, I don't know that that's all earmarked for scholarships. I'm sure a decent amount is. It also pays for your travel and all that stuff and the stipend and everything else involved in there. So, yes, we have a number of, uh, it's not going to be just, you know, one thing. It'll be as many as we can. Well, keeping in mind that we have to do this over time and we have to figure out what people, if you're trying to do a 4 plus 1, that also, you know, we have to think about that in terms of budgeting and making sure that this is the first year of our new grant, so there's a lot of scholarships available, let's say. All right, do it. Make me proud. All right, assignment five is also a way you can make me proud. <laughs> like that transition? Okay, cool. So do the 26th. Uh, this is a combo piece, <coughs> so the first piece is going to be the first part is on uh, policy, so you're going to be, I will give, I'll post on Piazza uh, today a policy on uh, mobile asset management. So the situation is you're the CISO of this organization, your underling or your direct report, that's probably a better way to say that in terms of underling, uh, your direct report will, has given you a draft of some management policy for how to manage uh, mobile assets. You're going to write a critique of the draft, identifying what aspects the policy does not cover, what aspects it should cover, and specifically why. You should also include in there justification for why you're focusing on these things and why you feel that there's no more and that the policy is complete. So if you feel there's one big glaring thing that is missing, you add that, justify why that makes a complete policy, you're done. If you have if you see three or four things, you should justify all of those and explain why that then makes a comprehensive policy. Does that make sense? Fair and reasonable, and we will evaluate it. So just text. So imagine you're writing an email. No text. Plain text email. Text file dot txt. Text. Text, text, text. ASCII text. There's no weird bytes, no crazy bytes. No weird stuff, what I've seen, no crazy quotes, curvy quote marks, uh, no pictures, diagrams, I guess you can make ASCII art if you want, but uh, just writing, this is a writing assignment. 
Uh, you'll find, this is actually one of the things I learned at Microsoft is that I spent a good, I don't know, 30 or 40 percent of my time like writing and communicating like emails and meetings that is not like coding. Like, the, there's coding and fixing bugs, but you also need to communicate with people and work together. So that's kind of why this is important. Questions? Yeah. It's uh, kind of stupid, but do you have a preference for how many columns is going to be a plain text file? <laughs> no, that's a good, uh, I'd say 80 is a good, okay. it's a fine one, but that's, I'm not that's right uh, right. super strict on that's that. That's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. Is this our last assignment? No. You'll have one more assignment. Also, there's a second part. So the second part is a network security part. So you will design a, uh, so we've talked about some of the data breaches and we talked about kind of, um, uh, in essence, when you've exploited a system, you need to then somehow get data back out of that system. And so the way you can do that here is you are gonna implement a program that will send a message and will encode the message secretly into the IP datagrams that you're sending. So specifically, we are going to use the ID field, the identification field, to, actually is that right? Okay, cool. So every byte of the message will be sent in the IP layer of a packet. So that you'll send one packet per byte of the message that you want to send. Uh, that's right. It'll be encoded in the high eight bits, so the uppermost eight bits of the ID field of the datagram, and the lower eight bits of the ID field will remain constant to be as part of this message. So you'll choose some random value as that will be the, the ID for that message. Um, and then there'll be another, uh, ah yes, so we'll encode the byte number into the fragment offset, so this will say which byte it is that you're sending. And when there's no more bytes to send, the highest bit of the fragment offset should be set to one, and the lower eight bits of the fragment offset should be set to the length of the message the total byte sent. So if follow this protocol, implement a command line interface just like you've been doing, and just like all the other assignments, you can write this in any language that you want. So basically, you'll be able to walk through these examples here, these packets that are getting sent. So this is sending the message test, and so it's encoding the T would be hex 74, uh, the lower bits of this ID field is 41, and this is byte number 0, uh, byte number 1, byte number 2, byte number 3, and finally the last one to say that there's no more is this message. And then we know, the other side knows that they've received all the message you're trying to send, and everything is good. So all you're writing for this is the client. Um, like I said, like all assignments, you can write this in any language you want. I highly recommend using Python with this Scappy library. Uh, as you'll find because you have to manipulate raw packets and create these packets where you're messing with the ID field, which normally the operating system will handle for you. So you can technically do it in whatever language you want. It, so you can use libnet is another way, but it's, uh, I highly recommend using it makes it much more difficult for us to debug and help you if you use something else. You can do it. I, I have faith in all of your abilities to do this in any programming language you want. Uh, ba -ba -ba, 1804, that's the same. I'll also provide you with the server implementation. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I'll also provide you with a server implementation so you can test your client. So this way you can have a Python server program running on your machine so you can test that the message is getting there correctly. I think that'll be a lot easier and help everything. Uh, similar things, make file, readme's, secret senders, the name of the executable. I think we've hit all these roadblocks earlier in the semester, so this should be pretty easy. Um, do you have any questions? Or, yeah, questions, yeah. So you said we can do it in any language, but you recommend Python? Yes. That is definitely the gist of what I said. It's definitely possible to do it in C. I've done it in C. It's just a pain. Whereas the Scappy implementation is it's not a ton of lines of code, yes, because the library is very good. Can we expect assignment six to be released on the 27th or during? That's a fair, yes, yes. Okay. Well, and it'll be due, so the next assignment will be, um, 
<coughs> basically a server or a, uh, a hacking assignment where there'll be a series of different challenges. You have to exploit a certain number for 100%. There'll be more than that number. Um, and you'll have up until like, basically like the last day. So it'll even go after finals. So as soon as you can get it done, that's good. So but it'll be available to do up until fall. The final for this class or the last day of finals? I think like the eighth is what I have planned. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What kind of exploits will that number be? You will, it'll be all stuff we've talked about in class. Okay. Yeah. Is there extra credit, like if you do more than? I don't know yet, okay. TBD. <laughs> Any other thing on this assignment? Wait, so basically we're creating a client program? Yes, that will exfiltrate data that you send through the ID field of a header. So basically, you can think of it as you're given this protocol of how data transfer should work with these different aspects of this uh, uh, inside here. And you have to implement a program that does that. I'll give you a server program that will be accepting these and we'll print out the message as it receives it. So that should help you a lot in terms of testing. And then just like before, there'll be automated test cases. We'll set the submission limit to 20 to start. Please don't use them all. I don't know why, how that happens every time, but um, yes. Yeah, so if uh, we're currently taking the computer networks class, wait, could that help us? I don't know, you tell me afterwards. I guess it depends on what you're doing there. Cool. All right. Good. Did that. Scholarship. Homework assignment. Cool. Let's rock and roll. All right. So speaking of networking, we've been talking about networking, and we've been talking at the different layers. So we've been discussing basically so far at the physical layer, link layer, IP layer, and now we're going to finally get up to the transport layer so we can understand what's happening at that level. Um, and so. Yeah, you'll, the packets you'll need to send, I believe, are ICMP packets or UDP packets with the um, IP layer messed with. So the easiest one to start with is UDP. So UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. Basic idea is UDP provides nothing on top of IP, which means what? What does IP provide or not provide in terms of guarantees? Yeah. No guarantee that your packets arrive in the order. No guarantee on ordering? What else? Yeah. That it's going to get there, that it's not going to double up. That it's not, that, that it's even going to get there, that it's not going to double. What else? The order. The order of the packets. Yeah. Do we already say, like, if it gets there at all? Yeah, if it gets there, all these kind of things. So it does nothing. It adds no, none of these reliability features. It provides exactly what IP provides. Connectionless, unreliable, best effort. So delivery, uh, the, I guess the one thing we didn't talk about was modification, so integrity. Uh, Non-duplication, ordering, and bandwidth not guaranteed. The one thing, yes? I was gonna say, uh, doesn't Discord use this for uh, their voice channels? Yes, I'll, I, I don't know about Discord specifically, but yes, a lot of VoIP happens over UDP for explicitly these reasons, because as we'll see, TCP provides a lot of these things, but it has a lot of overhead to do that. And in a real-time communication scenario, you don't care if your packets arrive out of order or something. Um, and, well, we won't look at it here, but in general, when you think about networking, you can, as an application, use UDP and add things like ordering to it if that's what you want. But let's say you don't want any of the other features. Um, so you can easily do that. And if you think about it, that's kind of what we're doing in the homework assignment, is we have a way of ordering the bytes that we're sending uh, because we're saying which byte it is that we're sending, and then we have a final signal which says how many bytes we've sent. Um, so that way the other side knows how many they should have seen. Um, the one thing that UDP provides, and this is something that goes back to when we initially talked about networking, <coughs> is it provides this idea of a port abstraction. So what's, why is a port important? It allows us to block certain ports if we want to kind of limit traffic. But what does it mean? What does a port extraction mean? I mean, we can do that, but. It tells you what service on that machine needs that information. Yeah, so it allows multiple different server applications to be listening on different ports on that machine so that that way clients can connect to exactly that application. So really going back to, um, 
So this TCP IP layering, right? So in order to know, am I talking to DNS or NFS, both of which use UDP by default, you need some way for one machine to be running both, and that's the idea of ports, and that's where ports come in. Uh, but again, it mainly, this is kind of the only addition that UDP has over IP. So it just has this idea of a port, so, so you can, like, going back to kind of the house analogy, so the IP address is the physical address of the machine, and the port number would be what apartment number are we trying to talk to of that machine. So look, yeah. Yeah, so without port abstraction, do you get like confusion amongst all the different packets coming in? Confusion without, you said? Yeah. Yeah, without you'd have no way, you'd only be able to run basically one application on one IP address, because there'd be no way of knowing who is this message for, right, of all the apps that are listening. Possibly, but you would need a way, like how would you, you need some kind of way of having an application, like what order do you pass packets to what applications? What do, I mean, theoretically I guess yes, you could think of some way, but then you're, going back to this model, then you're forcing every single application to have a way of distinguishing different protocols and doing all this kind of stuff, which uh, would be a pain. I guess you could do it like a, you could have kind of like there's magic bytes on files that tell you that it's a PDF or a JPEG or a PNG or whatever in the file format itself. You could have that, I guess, in every single DNS or NFS packet and then figure out where it goes to based on that. But um, then you're still kind of locked in and you can't, I, don't know, I think that would provide a lot of problems. So looking at a UDP message, so again, this is another layer that's gonna be on top of IP. So, and here, what fields do, do we expect based on what we saw about UDP? Port number. Port number, what port number? Just, just like 50? Just one. One? Yeah. Two from port number? Two. Why is two better than one in this case? Well, no, two is in the direction two. I'm sending it to a certain port from a certain Right, so just like IP addresses, right? We have a destination IP address and a source IP address. So similarly, in UDP messages, we have a source port and a destination port. How many port numbers can we have? Two to the 32? Two to the 16. Two to the 16, like 65,000, something, something, something. Cool, and we can see here, there's 32 bits. Each port takes up half, 16 bits. So the source port and the destination port for both 16 bits. Cool, and then we have uh, some header information. We have the length of the message, a checksum, and then the data. So there's really, and we can even, so there's the text description of this is what UDP adds on top of IP. We can actually look at just the header itself and say the only thing this is adding. So what's inside this data? Yeah. Like the IP packet? Yeah, the IP packet. And what's the start of that IP packet gonna have? Uh, okay. start the IP packet. Yeah, the header, the IP header. And then in that data section, there'll be the Ethernet frame information. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Oh, perfect. See, we're already there. Oh, that was wrong. Haha, -ha, you guys all got that wrong. <laughs> and me. We got it wrong, yeah. Is there an informal standard to how ports are numbered, like across different services? So I know ah. sometimes they're standard, but what if, like, a new video game comes out and they want a separate port for their server? Do we so, risk running out? Or? So, in general, there is. Um, there's, a, I don't know if it's ICANN, but there is a list of like defined ports. Now that doesn't mean that, so you can stand up a server and you can put any application listening on any port. So you can run a UDP server listening on port 80. It doesn't have to be an HTTP server. It's just, that's the kind of binding by default that says, hey, 
If I want to talk HTTP protocol, the server is likely at port 80, but a client, so for a client to connect to a server, what does it need for UDP of what we just saw? So going again to like what things it needs. Yeah. The destination port number? The destination port number, and what else? The, the what? What's in the IP packet? Yeah, so the destination IP, right? So we need to know the port IP that we're trying to send to. Sorry, we need to know the port number, the destination port number, and the destination IP address. So, and the question is, how do we figure that out? So the question was uh, about games. So you're developing a new thing. You control both the client and the server, so you can technically make whatever port number you want. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of complications, and there's, um, on most systems, not most systems, uh, port numbers less than 1024 are reserved for applications that run as root, typically. So you can look up the table. You can choose an unknown one, which would probably be the safe bet. You also have to think about if anybody else is blocking your traffic, because if you happen to choose a port number of a well-known, let's say, backdoor, then that would be a bad idea. Your packets are likely going to get blocked. So yeah, I guess it's, the answer is it's complicated, but technically there's no reason you, you can't choose whatever you want, especially when you control the client. Cool. Okay, so we were wrong. So inside the UDP datagram is the actual data of the message. And this is where finally we actually get the real data that we're trying to send. If we look at the Ethernet frame, and this makes sense because this Ethernet frame is going to change hop to hop. Right? As we saw, indirect delivery as the packet goes from hop to hop, new Ethernet frames with source and destinations for the current hop are put in the Ethernet frame. The IP header stays the same, except for the time to live value is changed. What about the UDP header? Yeah. Hopefully it stays the same. Yeah, it stays the same. There's, if we go back, there's nothing in here, right? There's just source port, destination port, message length, and checksum. That's it. So that data remains the same. So UDP is not complicated. Why? So how does a UDP packet get sent? <coughs> so wait, wait, you said ports. Which ports are you talking about? UDP port numbers? I was gonna say, so the actual data that we're trying to send is in the UD, UDP packet. Yes. And then that's embedded in the IP packet. Yes. And then that's embedded in the frame, the Ethernet frame. Right, exactly. So how does that packet travel? What's the difference between that and IP? Yeah. Is it a very similar, almost the same? It is the same, yeah, I would say. The only thing that's different is when the packet gets there, the operating system sees that it's a UDP packet, checks the header, and says, what port number is this destined for? Do I have an application that's listening on that port number? If so, give the packet to that application, and then let it do it. What happens if that application wants to respond? Yeah. It makes its own uh, UDP packet, and then that embeds that. It sends it to the operating system, which embeds it into like an IP packet. And, and what does that. it need to know? Or what is it? how does it respond? It needs to, it takes the original, the packet it got, because then it knows the source, and it makes the source its destination, and yep. then it knows itself. So. With port numbers. So that's how a UDP machine responds. But again, there's no, so just like before, if we think about if A sends a packet, if Alice sends a UDP packet to Bob, does Alice know that that packet ever got there? No. No. Does she know that Bob is even alive? No. So yeah, and that's what you get with UDP. Um, cool. This mean, yeah. It does. It has the source port and the destination port. Yes? Why would it need that? Because if you're making an application, wouldn't the application kind of know this and then put that as a destination? The answer is it depends. So 
for a protocol like this, yes, it would depend on the protocol of how do I respond to a message, right? It could be on a defined port, but here we're specifying what the source port is. So usually what will happen is, uh, let's say for something like DNS, DNS is a good example, you make a UDP request, you choose, your operating system will automatically choose a random source port, the source UDP port, and then it will wait and any packets that come back for, to that port, it gives back to the application. Um, so that's how it deals with that. But yeah, it's, it's one of the tricky parts of figuring that out. Because you, there is no idea of this connection. It's very much packet based, you're just sending data. So this gives you the ability to respond Nothing says you have to respond or that you should respond. And thinking about it in terms of attacking, right? So when we receive a UDP packet, what of this packet can we trust? The destination. The destination port, and that's it, right? The source port can be forged, and we talked about already the IP. The IP can be the IP source can be forged. Which leads us to, yeah. What do we mean that we can trust that the, dev I mean, the destination port like is going to be the port that it arrived at, but yes. what do you mean by trusting it? Because could it, that could be changed. So like another, we could have been sending this packet and someone changed it and so it came to us, but we didn't need it or it wasn't meant for us. Yeah, so I guess we can trust the fact that this destination port, in the same way that we can trust the IP, the destination IP and that we're receiving this, so it was, Somebody wanted it to come to us. But, 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 but it doesn't necessarily mean the, as we saw, it doesn't mean that source IP was the one who sent us that packet. Similarly here, there's nothing that says that the source IP at this source port is the person who sent us this packet. Right? They could be spoofed or it could be a man in the middle changing it along the way. Yeah, good question. So this means because there's basically no change from IP to UDP, this is why UDP is very easy to understand is all of the attacks that we talked about work against UDP that we talked about with IP. So what were some of those, very broadly? Spoofing, sniffing, Spoofing, sniffing uh, impersonation. Yeah, so UDP spoofing is trivial. It's I mean, not trivial, it's basically IP spoofing. So let's say that I have this server, I can spoof any UDP request to that server, and if I wanted to go to the client, what do I put in that packet? The client source IP. The client source IP? Yeah, that's it, and the source port. And then the server gets that, if it's responding, it will respond back to that client. This is actually how a lot of denial of service attacks happen, is that, um, like the, What's the name of the time system? Is it NTP? NTPD? Yeah. Network time protocol? Yes, NTP. So the NTPD, the network time protocol daemon, basically if you sent it a small request, it would send a reply back that was 15 times larger. So what you do is figure out which of these servers were vulnerable, figure out what client you want to take down, spoof those requests to each of these servers, a large number of them, all these NTP servers from around the world will then get pack UDP packets, reply with this 15x reply back to this client, and then basically overloading it and sending it too much information. Uh, and it all comes back to basically IP spoofing because uh, it's trivial to spoof a, a source IP address. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Are you going to ever show us how to do this? Or Let's think about go this. somewhere to see how this could be done? Let's think about this. What's the difference between doing this and your homework assignment? I guess it's the same thing. It is the same thing. Okay. You're creating raw packets where you're choosing the values in each of the protocols. So um, it's just the same as changing source IPs and destination IPs. So this is kind of the idea is all of this to me, there's basically no difference. I mean, once you see how you can forge a raw packet, as long as you understand the mechanics of what happens along the way, you can do all this stuff. So um, it's also 
I've created assignments like this for grad classes. They can be very delicate because some IPs or some ISPs don't like that. I mean, they like some won't let you spoof IP addresses, and so you have this problem of how can you make sure that everyone can actually do the assignment. So it's a big pain. But you can do. I mean, you can play around with this in your own local network. Is the way to do this is just like throw requests around and spoof, and spoof them and see what's going on. So we can also. So here, yeah. So put yourself in this situation. You're an ISP, right? Everyone have internet? How can the ISP know whether you're spoofing packets or not? Yeah, when you plug your your modem in, right, it gets it negotiates somehow a uh, IP address from the ISP. And so the ISP should know exactly what your IP address is. So this is called the uh, egress filtering, basically. So looking at, usually it's outgoing of a network. Uh, so like ASU, by doing egress filtering, it would say, no, like nobody can spoof an IP address that's not on ASU's network. Uh, a lot of times they don't actually do that because it requires processing power and it requires like keeping track of IP addresses and all this stuff. So many, many ISPs do not do any of that. Is there any legitimate reason to be sending packets with a spoof IP? No. <laughs> Not that I can think of. Yeah, which is crazy. But it's still a, you can still do this uh, in a lot of ways. Okay, so who, so think about this scenario. Who are we spoofing here? What's the trust that we're spoofing here? Yeah. We're spoofing uh, a packet sent from the client to the server. Right, so the server sees a request and thinks that it comes from the client. If this is NFS, a network file share, maybe this is delete the file. So now that file, file's gone. Um, what do we need to know in order to spoof this request? <coughs> the source IP of the client we wanted to spoof, the server IP address, and the destination IP address, or the destination port of the server. Do we need to be on the same local network as this server? No, right? As long as that packet will get there, as long as this IP address is a routable IP address. So this means you can do crazy, actually I don't know if you can do that, that would be interesting. Spoofing a packet, I assume you can. Spoof an attack, a packet from an attacker, completely external, to a server pretending to be a local address, like a 192.168 address. Um, I'm not sure if they'll route. I'm sure they would actually. Yeah. I do believe that's how you do like server side cross scripting. Like it's usually kind of more application level though. Yes, and that's slightly different, which is what because you're doing it at the application. There's no IP changing of the packets, but yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. I, I thought most outbound WAN ports drop anything to use the private source packet. It definitely. It definitely drops packets where they have a private destination IP, but I don't know about the source IP. That's what I'm, I don't know. I would be interested to figure that out. I think that'd be an interesting question. Um, cool. But what about the reverse? Can we do the reverse? What if we want to spoof the server's reply to the client? Can we do that? So when would we want to do that? Yeah. If it's like a web page request, we could spoof like a web page that's being sent back to the client. Web pages aren't over UDP; they're oh. over TCP. Some, something else. But yes, if we could do that, I mean, in the general concept of spoofing a server to a client, that's exactly what we want to do. What about in uh, UDP? What protocols have we talked about that use UDP? DNS. DNS. Why is DNS important? It maps domain names to IP addresses. So if you can convince somebody that Google.com is at your IP address, they will come to you instead of Google.com. So if the client is going to make a request to a <coughs> DNS server that says, hey, I want the IP address of Google.com, then what do I need to do as an attacker to spoof that response? Yeah. You should know the IP address. Louder, sorry. You should know the 
the server's IP and the client's IP? You need to know the server's IP and the client's IP so that you can properly craft a packet that is to the client from the server. What else do you need? And the ports. The ports? Which ports? You should probably know at least the client's um, source port. So you need it. So you need. So you would, would definitely need the server's source port in some sense. The server's port, so you can set the, the from port correctly. And then you also need, so again, looking at this UDP request, right? The client is making a UDP request to this server. You want to basically be able to respond to this reply. So what do you need from that packet? The way the message is oh, What was that? Uh, we're gonna say that the way the message is like the request is properly. Yeah, so you, it's DNS, that's a protocol. You can look up the RFC for DNS. You can crack, create a reply. What do you need to know? What information from there? Yeah. You need to know, um, this is for DNS, right? Sure. Yes, it applies to any UDP packet. Oh, never mind. The data involved in the UDP request for the DNS request? The data, eh. Whatever. I don't care who they're requesting. I still want to spoof the IP address or the DNS request and say it comes to me. The key is the whole <coughs> I need what? But what do I need from there to, to reply? Uh, like you said, the IPs. IPs? Port numbers. Port numbers. Why do you need the port numbers? So, like, you know, so if the client sends to from a port to a port, you would expect to reply from, from the port it sent to. Yeah, it goes back to that communication protocol we talked about, right? The DNS request. So the client's going to randomly generate. A, a port number, send it to the server as the source port, and is expecting a UDP reply to that, to that port. So, yeah. Quick question. So if the operating system generates a random port and starts listening on that, mm -hmm. if you intercept that message and you know which port it's listening on, can you then use that to like send a script into the client's that whatever port it's listening on now, that's an open port? You can't send this. Uh, all you can send is packets, right? So you can craft a UDP packet that has the source IP of the server, the source port of the server, the destination IP of the client, and the destination IP, a destination port of the client's port. That's the response to that. And send it, if you get there before the server, the server will think that that's what your reply is. But that's what the server's reply is. So, so thinking about that, can we do this remotely? Yeah. Will we be able to see? So, think about this. Another way to think about it is doing it blind. So, can we, without seeing this UDP request, can we make a reply? Yeah. <coughs> what was that? Yeah, how many do you have to guess? Like 65,000. Yeah, 65,000. That's actually not that much. You've been, you're experienced with large numbers and hashing and how many hashes per second and packets per second. And maybe you could do this a few times, or if you can force the client to make that DNS request, maybe eventually you can get it. So it is possible, but it's noisy, right? You have to get guess it right. Um, better way is to intercept and get a copy of this UDP request. How can you get that? Listening on the uh, gateways between. Maybe yeah, listening on any of the switches in between? Yeah. It's Wi-Fi, you can just be at listening. Like, on a public yeah. Wi-Fi, you could listen to all of the unencrypted packets that are being sent. What else? Spoof your ID, how does that help you get the packet? Yeah. Well, if you if you had compromised the switch and like had a had your IP address associated with the MAC address of the server on its like ARP cache, then when it sends the Ah, so you don't you don't have to compromise the switch, right. but you can use ARP the things we talked about in local network attacks, right? With ARP poisoning, right? Then we can intercept a copy of this packet as well, right? So that's why we talked about those, so we can think about how they manifest in each of these different contexts. So here, was, if you can do that, 
then all you have to do is spoof a UDP reply with that information, and that way, if you can do it faster before the reply gets to the client, now, if you think about it from the client's perspective, they have, again, absolutely no way of knowing that this packet was spoofed and is not originally from the server. Yeah? Will the client discard the actual real UDP reply when it receives it? Yes, because it's not expecting. The, the, I guess a high level question is it depends on the protocol or what the application is. In terms of DNS, you make a request and you expect one reply and then you're done. You just discard the next thing. Yeah. What if there's a So whatever gets first wins or Yeah. Yeah, whoever gets there first definitely wins. Any other questions? Okay. Cool. Now we think at a high level. How do we break into a remote application or a remote server? Think about it this way. Did we talk about breaking into a bank? So what are the steps? You've all watched movies. <coughs> How do you break into a bank? Yeah. You go to the bank. No. <laughs> yes. That's one step. Yes. <laughs> that was a joke. You have yeah. A team together? Yeah, you have to assemble the crew first. That's the first step, right? You need a nice montage, like and you assemble the crew and then what do you do? So then you just go right to the bank? Storm the bank. bank. You just storm the bank from there. What was that? Is it louder? You gotta why do you investigate the bank? Yeah, you gotta scope the joint, right? You have to like go to a cafe across from the bank and like read a newspaper while you look at like when the guards come there, when do they change positions, when do they when is the safe open, who's the manager, right? You need to find out as much information as you can about this bank, go to City Hall, get the plans of the bank, find out as much information as you can, and then you actually try to rob the bank with that plan, or I guess then you formulate a plan. Robert execute the plan and then it all goes to heck and doesn't go well. So the reason why we're talking about this is breaking into a remote system is the same way. That first step is you need to understand, you need to do reconnaissance and understand what is this system. So if we think in terms of some remote machine that we want to exploit, what do we want to know about that? How can, so think of it even conceptually. There's some machine somewhere. We want to exploit it. How? Yeah. First, try to find out what protocol it's using. Why? Because then you know what you can actually spoof and how to spoof it. Yeah, so think about this. So there's some remote system. The only way we could possibly influence that system is by somehow getting our data to that system. Right? So we need to know what are the ways that we can get data into that system. Yeah. Can't you also think about the other people that are using it and use those people to gain access to the remote server? Yes, but we need to know what's this server doing first. Maybe there's nothing. It all depends. Just because it's part of an organization, it could be nobody uses that server, right? Um, but yeah, that's a good way to think about it, like people focus. Um, yeah? Uh, enumerate the services and from there, potentially service like version. Yeah, so we'd want to know, basically we need to do the same thing and perform some kind of reconnaissance, right? To understand what services are listening and running on that remote system, right? Is it an email server? Is it, does it, is it running an SSH server? Is it running DNS? And so essentially what we want to try to learn is what applications are listening on what port of that system. Would you agree that that would be useful? Yeah, yes, no, yes. Cool, yes. So, the idea there is called port scanning. So we want to scan a remote system <coughs> and find out what applications are listening on which port. And specifically for UDP, we want to find out what applications or what services are listening. So how can we do that? No, I mean, that's just a program. Yeah. You can just send packets to every single port. And then what? Order. Ask it if it's or see if the operating system responds, whichever ones that respond. Yeah, so if you think about it, this is all we have to work with, right? The UDP message. So we have the ports, the source ports, destination ports. So if you think about it conceptually, 
we basically want to, so there is no protocol to just ask a system what ports are open. So we basically brute force and send a packet to every port on the system. And then we need some way to tell if that port is open or not. Because let's say we get a response, what do we know? It's open. It's open, yeah, we definitely know it's open. What if we don't get a response? Why? Yeah, if we don't know anything, the packet may not have got there, but let's say it did get there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the application, maybe we're not speaking the right protocol to that specific application. So there maybe could have been an application there that is rejecting our message, or maybe there's no application there and there's nobody listening on that port, right? And we'd like to be able to tell those uh, differences apart. So this is why the idea of port scan is actually super interesting and it's tied into little details about how operating systems actually operate and what they do if in these different circumstances of is there an application listening on that port versus not. Um, so a normal UDP port scan is actually fairly simple. You send a zero length UDP packet to each port. If you get an ICMP, so there's an ICMP message which is the what we talked about the uh, basically an IP, uh, well, you'll figure that out because you'll have to deal with things, but uh, you'll get a message that says the port, port is unreachable from the operating system. And then you can tell, right? Yeah. That, but that will tell you that it's closed? That will tell you that nothing is listening on that port, exactly. So what you'll do is you'll send out packets. If you get a reply back, then you know that port is definitely listening. If you get this message, you know there's definitely not anything listening. And if you get nothing back, then you're pretty sure there's something listening there. Maybe you send a few packets to confirm. Yeah? What if the ICMP message just gets dropped like it did with the ACMP? Yeah. So you are you need to try different methods and different things. So you try different techniques of what happens in certain um, and it's all about, again, the networking stack of the operating system. What do they do in cer certain circumstances? Yeah? Oh, sorry. If, if you have this server you're talking to, how come you don't already know what it's doing? Like, how did you get that server to begin with? So let's say I know that I'm pen testing company X, and I know that they have an IP address range. That's this whole, whatever, a slash 24. And so I can send ping packets to every machine on that IP address range to figure out how many IPs there are. And then from there, I'd want to understand how many, uh, what are running what services. And that would give me a nice attack surface. Um, and I want to go further from there to figure out exactly what version of software are they running on each of those systems. Are they old versions with known exploits that I can just throw at them? Um, the trick here is that it can be very slow because many TCP IP stacks limit the error rate. So you can't just send 65,000 packets to them at once. Um, so the, the Linux limit is eight messages for every four seconds. So this is why the default kind of UDP scan if you're using something like Nmap, uh, which we'll talk about here. So these are things you can go home, install Nmap, run it on, I would still, I guess we didn't talk about this. Well, we'll talk about that in a second, but I still run this against systems that you control, just because it's nicer. Uh, so Nmap, you need to run as root usually because, well, I don't know if you need to do it in this case. But sometimes you need to run it as root because it may create packets. But basically, Nmap, the N stands for <coughs> network, it's a network mapping tool. You can do that ping scan I mentioned to scan a whole IP address range for machines that are active. Um, the dash U option is the capital U is the UDP port scan. So it would scan this and it would tell you, and I think by default, the other thing that's important is it's only scanning the top 1,445 ports that are known to be used by UDP. So it's actually not scanning and trying every, 60, every port from one to 65,000. Um, and so it will tell you that on this machine, there's NetBIOS NS, NetBIOS DMG, and it took four seconds to scan that. Are the vulnerabilities for each port dependent on the service that they're associated with? Yes. And not only what service, but what specific application, because a vulnerability is tied to the software. So 
if you found out that it was running a DNS server, you need to figure out exactly which version of that DNS server it's running and which, you know, is it bind, is it some other implementation, yeah. Uh, TCP dump, does it do the same thing that MMAP does in this situation? So TCP dump is 100% passive in that it just listens and logs packets. So you would, what I would do is to figure out how Nmap works, run TCP dump to see all the packets that Nmap is sending, and then get all the like. So that way, you're, it's essentially like debugging Nmap to figure out what it's actually doing. So in this case, you'd see a bunch of, you'd see 1,445 UDP packets, and you'd get back basically, what is it, 100, 1,443 ICMP port closed messages and you get two that were not, and those are the ones that are likely open, but you still don't know. And you don't even know, again, the only reason this is saying it's NetBIOS-NS is because port 137 is associated with that service. It could be anything running on that port, so you need to do more information to figure out what's actually there. Cool, any questions on this? Awesome. And now we move into TCP. So TCP gets a little bit more complicated. And finally, we get some features from our networking protocols that we would like. We get connection oriented, which means that we can establish a connection with a remote system. We get reliable delivery, and we get a stream. So what's the difference between streams and packets? Or datagrams, I guess, yeah. Streams in order. Say that again? Streams in order. So stream is in order, and what else? Is it constant? Stream of packets? Is it like a chain of packets? Cl kind of. I'd say it's more, it's in some sense an abstraction. So rather than thinking about it in terms of packets, the data that one side sends to another forms a stream of data. So we can just send a bunch of information from one side to the other, not worrying about how many packets need to get sent. The operating system can configure that out. And on the other side, they just read bytes and they can read from the stream of data. Um, so you get really nice features that way. We also get, in terms of our stream, it's reliable. <coughs> and when I say reliable, does this mean we're guaranteed that the other side will receive our packets? No, what if some undersea cable gets cut? Right? You can't guarantee that the packets are gonna get there. But you can guarantee that the other side saw the data that you wanted to send. So that is the part that you can actually guarantee. So that's what the, uh, when we talk about reliable here, we mean that there's no, we know that there was no lost packets, we know that there was no duplication, we know that there were no, well, transmission <laughs> errors, it's kind of, and we know that it's in the correct order, and we know when the other side has received all of our information, uh, which is important. The other thing, <coughs> is the port abstraction. So again, we have ports in TCP. They work exactly the same as in UDP, which means they're how big? 16 bits. 16 bits? Yeah. See, good. I'll be popping all these uh, questions on you. So the idea is TCP provides us and our applications with this idea of this virtual circuit or virtual communication channel that's identified by four different things, and this is kind of forms the base of a lot of TCP communications. So it's the, because we don't want to just be able to, to talk between one IP and another IP. Why? No, we're, we're not worried about forging because, well, so let's think about this. When I talk to another machine, what am I talking to? Yeah. Uh, so the idea is, so we're going to establish this kind of communication channel, but how do we define that channel that we're talking on? So do we talk just IP to IP? Oh, because like multiple applications are talking at the same time. Exactly, right? We could have multiple applications running on one IP address that want to talk to multiple different IP addresses running on the remote system. <coughs> and so we need to establish communication that way. This is the whole idea of the port. So. We abstract it up and we have basically source IP, des source port, destination IP, destination port. There's a four tuple that defines a communication channel. This is incredibly important and it kind of underlies all of TCP um, communications. Uh, other interesting things is this 
grading this circuit, you have two full streams. So this means either side can send data to either one at any time um, and can actually close. Uh, other things is this idea of IP address port number is called a socket. So this is when you talk about socket programming. This is usually what we're talking about. Uh, looking at the, the header in more detail. So again, just like UDP, we have source port and destination port, right? Which makes sense because every packet in TCP needs to come from this. We also now have this problem where we need to know where we are, right, in this stream. Because we have a stream of data we're trying to send from one side to the other. Where in this stream are we? So, <coughs> so this is, TCP is going to introduce some more concepts, which we'll talk about exactly how they're used. And it's important to talk about and understand how they're used so we can go back to our familiar friends of spoofing and hijacking to see how can we do this in this TCP uh, context. So we'll see this, but safe to say there's a sequence number, which is a, how big? 32 bits. We have an acknowledgment number that's 32 bits. Uh, we then have some other special things, some special flags, which we'll see what some of them do. Uh, we have the window number, checksum, pointers, option, <coughs> padding, a whole lot of stuff. So you can see that TCP is definitely more complicated than UDP just by looking at the headers. Right? UDP was just source port, destination port, basically done. Here we have a lot more things. And it makes, and so why does this make sense that, or does it make sense that TCP has more complicated headers? It does make sense. Why? Because the reliability. Yeah, you, need to, you can't get that stuff for free, right? You can't get that reliability and those guarantees for free. You need to add something to it, right? So this is what's being added to it. So, uh, question? So by s sequence number, is that like the order in which that we read it? We will find that out in a second. I was gonna ask what acknowledgement number was it? Yes, it's related to the sequence number. But it's important to kind of see just the layout and the size so we can conceptualize that, yeah. So you cannot, mm, that's a good question. I would say, my intuition is no, you can't have both a TCP and a UDP service listening on the same port. One port, one protocol, one app is what I believe to be the case. Yes? I think in a similar question as this, or a different note, is I saw you mention them as TCP ports, but it's just port in general, right? Yes, although I guess by convention, because we're often talking about TCP, so. Yeah, that's a good question. I should check that out. You may be able to, but because the operating system would know which protocol yeah, it is, and it would know. But I don't know if it actually does that for you. Yeah. But so even if it could, so if that operating system is the one that uh, responsible for routing to the which service to the application, yeah. Because the app the application will make a call to the operating system that says, "Hey, I want to listen for this protocol on this port, and give me any packets that are." I'm listening for that. Um, so you'll see how that's done in the client code. You're only, you're only writing a server. All right, what was your question again? Did that answer it? Uh, yeah. Sure. I think so. OK, cool. Me too. OK, cool. So just like before, we have our TCP header with our TCP data that's being sent, which is put inside of an IP header and the IP data, which is then put inside of the Ethernet header with the Ethernet data. So just like before, so, all right, there's a lot of text here. And it's really just, mm, I really hope we're still recording. How can I? You know what, I'm gonna, okay. So, we go back to our handy dandy scenario. We have Alice. Who wants to communicate with Bob over TCP? So let's say Bob is running an HTTP server on port 80. And so what does Alice need to do to like start the, what information does she need to start in a connection with Bob? Destination. Yeah. Destination IP, destination port, and then source IP and source port. Bob IP. Destination port 80, uh, 
Alice IP. And some source. Uh, we'll call it, we'll go, eh, I don't know. All right, we'll go 41, 41. Right, okay, so this is all the information, and Alice has all this information, right? <coughs> she knows Bob's IP. If she didn't have an IP, she had a domain name and used DNS in order to translate that domain name to an IP address. But at the end of the day, before any packets go out, or any TCP packets go out, Alice needs to know Bob's IP address. She knows it's port 80 because it's talking HTTP, and she knows her IP address and some random source port we'll call 4141. Cool. Yes? That was my question. Okay. Cool. So, but when we think about it, and what we've been thinking about is what does everyone know at this point? So does Alice know that Bob is up and exists? No. Well, no, why not? Yeah, it hasn't sent anything. Nothing hasn't been sent, right? So we need to do some way in order to initiate a connection to Bob, right? Before we can ever talk to Bob, we don't know whether Bob's up. We don't really want to send any data. We need to kind of, if you think about this as a communication link or a, a circuit, we need to be able to verify that that other side is up and wants to talk to us. Could be that Bob doesn't want to talk to us and he tells us to go away. So what Alice will do, <coughs> is we'll send a, a TCP packet, bless you. So, so source port, uh, 4141, destination port, 80, and I'm kind of mixing the headers here, but that's okay. Source <coughs> IP is Alice IP, Destination IP is Bob's IP. Now, when Bob gets this, how does he know that this message isn't part of a current ongoing communication with Alice? Yeah? Because he would recognize her IP address if they've spoken to each other before. Yeah, so, so we need, well, so first he would uh, use the IP port, right? So he'd say, Am I already, well, one way you could say is, am I talking to Alice's IP on port 4141? But another thing is, maybe it would be nice to say that this is like an opening, like a starting communication message. Would that be the acknowledgement uh, thing from the IP, from the TCP? Close. Uh, so this comes into the flags. So inside of these flags, there are a number of different bits that can be set. Uh, one of them is the SYN bit, S-Y-N. So set that bit to one, all the other five bits to zero, which essentially will then tell Bob, hey, I want to initiate a new connection with you. So there's another, so Bob can get this. There's another flag called uh, reset, R-S-T, where you can send that back to basically say, go away, don't talk to me. That's one way Bob could say. But Bob wants to do this communication. So, sends this. We know exactly what happens on every hop of the way, right? How this communication gets from Alice to Bob. We know that. We've looked at that, studied that. Bob gets it back. What is he going to reply? Yeah. Would it also be with the send bit? Well, what about the data here? So we have the sin, we have ports, des source, destination, source IP, destination IP. So what's the source, the source port? 80 and the destination port? 41, 41. What about, so source IP? Bob, I, I know I'm running out of space, and so I just do less less. All right, Bob's IP and destination IP? Alice's IP. Alice's IP. So one thing that we need to figure out is Bob will needs to have some way to say this is I'm responding to your request, right? So it just so happens, and you would think of there could be any number of bits. They don't have to be these, but they this is what they are. So he'll set two bits: the <coughs> sin and the act flag. So Bob will send that back to Alice. Now, 
So how does Alice, so what does Alice know when she receives this packet? Bob is up. The reply was meant for Alice. The reply was meant for Alice. Yeah, one thing though that, well, we, how do we know that it was this request? What if we just talked to Bob two minutes ago? So we had a, a talk with Bob, we closed our communication, and then I want to talk to him again. How do I know that this packet is a direct response to this packet and not a packet from two minutes ago or five minutes ago that just got lost in the ether and then was found? Yeah. Maybe that has to do with the, like, the sequence number? So, but can, I mean, talking about oh. here, the information here, right? Is there enough information to tie the, this request, this response to this request? Not in this, right? Because the, and you think about it just in terms of information, right? There's nothing in here that says this is a reply to this message. So we need some kind of like random number or something that will kind of be able to say, hey, this is this message. And that way, if that random number is included in that response, it will show me exactly what that response is. So this is kind of the basis for the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. They're used a little bit more complicated when they start to talk. But at least in terms of setup, <coughs> so Alice will what she generate an acknowledgement number. I think we'll ignore this for now. So Alice will generate a random sequence number and send that along. And that way, when Bob replies, he can put in his acknowledgement number. Yeah, this makes sense. Okay. How fancy do you think I can get? Not fancy enough. All right. That did not work. OK. So I'm just going to add it to the bottom. So, and so to go more in depth here, the reason why this sin flag is set is this sequence of, well, that's not true. OK, forget that. OK, so what Bob will do is he will reply back in his acknowledgment number. So there's two numbers here, the sequence number and the acknowledgment number. Bob will reply back with acknowledging Alice's sequence number plus one. Why the plus one? Seems silly, right? All we need to verify is that the response came from that initial request that we made. Why the plus one? Yeah. To keep the communication going back and forth, and so, I don't know. It seems very trivial, right? Yeah. I was going to say, like, because TCP is supposed to be like a stream instead of like just a series of packets. Mm -hmm. So, like, I guess the idea would be like this is part of this particular connection, like, that we've just started rather than. Potentially, like. But do you need it? Like, like, do you need it? Because the goal here is to link the request with the response. So, do you need a plus one here? No. No, right? Yeah. I was gonna say yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, that could go away, right? And it's totally fine. The same thing still works. Um, the reason is actually goes back to. If you remember endianness from architecture days. What's endianness? It's like what is the story? Like, 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 yeah. yeah, so if we think about this 32 bit number, right, it's 32 bits that are broken up into four bytes. Which byte is the most significant byte or the least significant byte? Is this the most significant byte, these, these eight bits, or is this the most significant byte? And different operating systems are different, right? So Intel, I believe, is little Indian, I want to say which means that the most significant bit is actually on this side, on what you consider the lower side. Um, but whereas, so a lot of systems are little endian where I believe, and I may be, no, it's definitely right. So where 
Whereas this TCP, if you look at it, it's defined as big Indian. So the number is big Indian. So basically, this was like a debugging capability that it's trivial to rip this sequence number from the packet that you received and put it in the new packet. Right? You just literally copy the bytes. That does not mean that you can interpret that number as what it's <coughs> supposed to be. So the idea was they added one here. So that way it says you know how to do math and you can speak the proper byte ordering here. So it's kind of a cool, clever, like almost mini debugging thing in the protocol. Um, okay, cool. So are we good? So now, so now Alice knows what? We're talking about what does Alice know when she receives this packet? Yeah. Like we said, the host is alive. Bob is alive, and what else? He's ready to communicate. He's ready to communicate, and he specifically wants is replying to that message that I sent. Is that it? Are we good to go? We just start chatting. Yeah. And that they're on the correct engine. Say again. And that they're compatible. Yeah, that they're compatible exactly, so that Bob can do the the sequence number plus one. Yeah. Do we actually know? We don't really know it's Bob replying to us, right? It could just Definitely not. Yeah. So, okay. But we know that this is a reply from Bob's IP that includes the right sequence number that we're expecting, right? So we're thinking about now how the protocol is designed is not thinking about these attacks, which we'll talk in a second. So are we good to talk? Good to go rock and roll? Yeah. Uh, we need to acknowledge Bob's synapse. Why? Uh, because if we, we could send it and then drop off, and then Bob's like, OK, I'm ready to connect. Yeah, so if we think about this, right, we always got to consider there's two parties who are trying to communicate here, Alice and Bob. So we've always been looking at it right now from Alice's perspective. What does Alice know? And what does she know about Bob? But if we look at it from Bob's perspective, so Bob receives this first packet, which means what to Bob? Oh, Alice wants to connect. Alice wants to start talking. And then Bob sends this message. And then what does Bob know? Nothing. Nothing. Bob knows nothing. Right? Bob doesn't know if Alice got the reply or maybe Alice shut off in that time in between. Right? So a lot of people, I don't know, they think about like a three-part handshake or whatever, why you need the three. You can reason yourself very clearly into why you need three. So, so Alice, whoa, hello. So Alice needs to reply before Bob knows that this is a communication that needs to continue. So Alice will create a packet and will be essentially replying to Bob's reply. So Alice will reply and she will do destiny, uh, source IP forty one forty one destination IP port. port. Yeah, whatever. And source IP, Alice's IP, uh, destination IP, uh, Bob's IP. Cool. Okay. Now, how does Bob know that this is a legit reply to his message? You see, we again have the same problem, but from the different perspective, right? We're looking at Alice. Alice didn't know if Bob's reply was directly to her message. And now we have the problem from Bob's perspective. How do I know that Alice is actually replying to the message that I sent? <coughs> so we're going to use the same trick. It's not anything complicated. We just use the same concept. So Bob will generate his own sequence number that is unique from Alice and will send it as the sequence number of his packet. So he will send sequence number of Bob. And how will Alice respond? Yeah, in the acknowledgement. Oops, that's weird. So sequence number of Bob plus one. Uh, we'll find out on apparently on Thursday why she will also send the sequence of Alice plus one as her sequence number. And so, should, so now she needs a way of, of saying that this is a reply to your reply. 
And so she will send back a message with just an act bit set. So this is the classic. So this would be one thing you should definitely burn into your brain about a TCP connection. Sin, sin, ack, ack. And now at this point, now once Bob, so at this point, Alice knows that Bob's up and ready to talk. Once Bob receives this message, he knows that Alice is up and ready to talk. And now they can both communicate and start communicating. So we'll see how these sequence and acknowledgement numbers give us the basis so that we can have reliable communication from both sides. <laughs>